Good morning, church. We have a lengthy announcement this morning, so bear with me. Of course, we know that Angela came home from the hospital Tuesday. She will be unable to receive visitors for a while, and Mills will have to wait until until di direct, uh, dietary restrictions are lifted. Uh, also, I believe she had trouble with her blood pressure yesterday and went back to um, Williamson Medical, and uh, but I believe she is back home this morning. We extend our sympathies to, to the family of Cindy Carter Boyce. She passed away, I believe that was last night. That is the daughter of Rick and Kathy Carter. Jerry Mercer expected to have surgery on his back. I believe that is March the 31st. Um, Glenda Goodman will have a surgery, I believe that's tomorrow for her pacemaker, is that right, Roxanne? Uh, I believe they were removing one and replacing the old one. Hayden Bass um, has some kind of stomach issues and fever. Uh, I believe he was in Williamson Medical also yesterday and they're running tests on him, see. Uh, birthdays is Peyton, Peyton Mitch, Mitchell, March 23rd, and Scotty Bass, March 24th. Any other announcements? If you could, just please keep uh, the Flat Rock congregation in okay. prayer. They, they've had a big outbreak. I'll say big for them. Yeah. The Flat Rock congregation that has a outbreak of COVID for some reason, I think there's at seven members, 13, I don't know the last number. But anyway, so keep them in your prayers. Um, any other announcements? Scripture reading this morning is Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Brother Steve. Can we do? Let's sing three songs, and then we'll have our opening prayer in the communion. Over all the earth you reign on high, every mountain stream.
Father, Jehovah God, your name is above all names. You are the giver of life and the giver of all good gifts. And Father, this morning we thank you that this good number has assembled here to worship you, Father. And we pray, Father, that for those who either fear being out in public for those who have just gotten out of the habit of, of being here, we pray, Father, that soon that they will all be back with us, Father, serving you, praising you, and worshiping you. Because truly, your name is worthy of praise. Father, we thank you for such a beautiful day, this early part of spring, which is so exciting to us every year. Just the warm sunshine, the blooming of the the flowers and budding of the trees. And Father, we look forward with great anticipation the days ahead where we can be outside more. Father, we pray this morning especially for Angela, uh, Riley, and Hayden Bass. Father, we pray that those uh, situations will improve and pray that soon Hayden will have a diagnosis and uh, a treatment can, can be put in place to bring him back to health quickly. And we just pray for your continued help and, and Angela's rehabilitation. Father, we ask you to bless uh, Jerry Mercer uh, as he has uh, back surgery upcoming and be with Glenda and the uh, medical staff tomorrow as they do the uh, pacemaker replacement, Father. Father, this morning uh, we ask your special blessings to be with Greg as he strives to spur us on toward love and good deeds and a faithful life with his message that he's prepared. And Father, we just pray that our worship here this morning be acceptable in your sight, Father. These things we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus. And amen. We gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. No one is. Strange. 
the words correctly. In one of the areas that we advertise with World Bible School is in State College and in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. One of the contacts we got there in that area is Vera Valerie. <laughs> She's uh, 27 years old. She has no religion affiliation whatsoever. In her spiritual journey, she said, when asked about the existence of God, she said, maybe. Maybe there is an existence of God, but she was not sure. She also said, I do not know about Jesus Christ. The eunuch was kind of like in that situation. He was reading from the book of Isaiah. Who is this Jesus? Of course, God called Philip to go to the eunuch in Acts chapter 8. He comes up running up to the chariot in Acts 8. Starting off with verse 30, he says, So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guide me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. As a sheep led to the slaughter, as a lamb before his shearer is dumb or silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was, justice was denied. Who can describe his generation? For his life was taken up from him, from the earth. Verses 38, or excuse me, 32b and 33a is a quote or a reference to Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. If you continue to read with this, he talks about in verse 34 and 35, he says, And the eunuch said to Philip, In whom I pray, or he's asking, I ask you, does the prophet speak, say this about him or someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth, beginning with this, this scripture, he told him the good news of Jesus Christ. Valerie, one of my students, if she sticks out doing these courses here with World Bible School, she will get to know about Jesus Christ. Jesus and Him crucified, Galatians 2, verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, but Christ that liveth in me. Jesus Christ is the one who died on the cross for us. But there's people out there that do not know about Jesus Christ in the United States. Jesus, who loves us very much. He loved us so much that he was willing to die on the cross for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful so much for this day, for the beautiful day. We're thankful, Father, for this time period that we can think about what Jesus has done for us. To be able to take of the bread which represents your dear son's body was, which was hung on the cross. We're thankful, Father, for this time that we can remember and reflect upon what Jesus has done for us. Thank you so much for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.
Just pray. Hebney, great, merciful, almighty God, we're so thankful that you love us, that you hear our prayers wherever we are. We're thankful, Father, for your dear son, Jesus, who is willing to give up the throne to come to this earth to live among us sinful people. He was a perfect sacrifice, willing to, to die on the cross for us. Even in the garden, he said, not my will, but thy will be done. He was whipped. Thorns pounded into his head. He was mocked. He was hit. He was laughed at. And he was nailed on that cross for us. We're thankful, Father, for this time period that we can do this. The first day of the week, Sunday, in remembrance of what your dear son has done for us because he loved us so much. We're thankful to be able to take the fruit of the vine, which represents your dear son's blood, which was shed on Calvary. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me again, please, if you would like. First song says that you're here for this one. <clears throat> Breathe new life right through me like a 
church. If you have a Bible or a Bible app available to you, I invite you to turn to two passages of Scripture this morning. Luke chapter 16 and Ephesians chapter 2. Luke 16 and Ephesians 2. In addition to all the uh, prayer requests that have been mentioned this morning, uh, if you all would add one more name this morning. I felt sorry for Daryl, uh, and I didn't want to give him yet even more. So, uh, uh, the name Marty Ross. If you all will say a prayer for my friend Marty up in Kentucky. He's got to have both hips replaced. And so... Uh, and the first one of those is going to be this week. And so if you'll remember Marty in your prayers this morning. All right. If you would, bow with me for a moment. Holy Father, we just thank you for your love and your mercy and grace. And Father, I just pray now that as we turn to Holy Scripture yet again, that the truth of your word will be revealed this morning and that your spirit will speak through me. Father, may this message be yours and yours alone. It is in the name of Jesus I offer this prayer. Amen. There is no story quite like this. We were enemies of God. We were dead in our sins, living for ourselves, when God, in His great mercy, made us alive in and through Christ Jesus. Now, there are two parts to this. The first is that Luke 16 part, where we talk about being dead in our sins. The Ephesians 2 part that we're going to get to a little later is the alive in Christ portion of this message. And so I invite you to turn with me to Luke 16 where Jesus tells a parable. And some scholars have even debated whether or not this is an actual parable. Because it is, if it is a parable, it's the only parable where Jesus actually gives a name to one of the characters. His name is Lazarus. Not to be confused with the Lazarus that we read about in John chapter 11, the brother of Mary and Martha, whom Jesus would raise from the dead after spending four days in a tomb. 
Now this is a different Lazarus. But in Luke 16 verse 19, we read about his story along with a rich man. Luke 16, 19, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Well, ain't that a happy story, church? Right? No. No. In the story, we have this rich man. We don't know his name. Jesus didn't think that was important, that that character be named. But we know that he's wealthy, not just because Luke tells us that he's wealthy, but because of some of the facts going along here. He lives in a house that has a gate. He wears clothing of purple, the most expensive thread you could buy in antiquity. And he also has these undergarments of fine linen. So the man is dressed to the nines, we might have said once upon a time. I don't know how you say in this day and age that someone's dressed well, but the man is dressed well. He has the best clothing that money can buy. And so he lives behind this gate. And even today, if someone lives in a gated community where you have to have some kind of passcode to get in or where there's a guard attending the gate, that's typically not a working class neighborhood, is it, church? And so we know that the man is wealthy. It's not up for debate. And then here Lazarus sits, seeing the man going and coming back and forth from that gate. Sitting there in agony to the point that dogs would come and lick his sores. Just wishing he could have something from the rich man's table. Just the leftovers, the crumbs... But the man doesn't think enough of Lazarus to even have a servant take him some food outside. And so when the man is in torment, he is begging, Oh, Father Abraham, just send Lazarus 
to dip that finger in water and put it on my tongue for just just to momentarily relieve a bit of my torment, my anguish. And so even in this situation, he still sees Lazarus in a servant role. Even in torment, he looks down his nose at Lazarus. Have him come and serve me. When he, with all of his wealth, was completely unwilling to ever serve Lazarus the beggar. And so there are two things about this. One, he, he cares about his brothers, and so the word repent is there. He knows that he never repented, and he knows that his brothers never have. And so that is what he desires for them to save them from the anguish that he is currently experiencing. But church family, it goes beyond that. All of us have heard the message to repent. But how we treat other people matters to God. Now, this isn't a message about salvation by works. No, the Ephesians passage is going to clear that up in no uncertain terms. That our salvation is a gift of God, plain and simple. But church family, let's never forget that if saved people act like saved people, then people like Lazarus are going to experience some degree of love and some degree of care. It's when Christians overlook someone who is in such obvious need that we have to wonder where their heart is. What kind of salvation experience did they truly have if they can be so callous to overlook the needs of someone who is in such obvious, desperate, a desperate state? Saved people need to act like saved people. When children of God overlook someone like a Lazarus. We're not doing the Lord's work, church. We're doing the devil's work. Now the title of this message is Old Scratch Part 3. And for those who are just joining us this morning, haven't been here the last couple of weeks and not familiar with the term Old Scratch, it is a term that was used some time ago to describe the devil. Now the origin of that word, well that gets complicated and it comes from Norse and German and those kinds of things. But Old Scratch is a name for the devil. And that's what we've been talking about. In these weeks that lead up to, to Easter, this is the final week we're going to talk about this. But that if we believe what, <clears throat> excuse me, Peter tells us, that the devil is real and that he is prowling around like a lion looking to devour his prey, and if we believe, as I do, that the devil's not concerned with the lost of this world the way we should be, the way Brother Tom is when he so passionately talks about his World Bible School students, and I'm right there with him because I had one in upstate New York that I thought was ready to be baptized, and now he's not continuing with the work. And that's the work of the devil, isn't it, Tom? Yeah. 
I've had three or four students that, man, they just seemed on fire working through the curriculum. And then all of a sudden, everything just grinds to a halt. And so then I send them notes of encouragement. And they say, oh, I haven't forgotten. I'll, I'll get back to it. But none of them really have yet. Because they were hearing the gospel message. And a couple of them that were already baptized believers were at that point where they were growing close to God once again. That church family is when the devil gets involved. In the Gospels, it's when Jesus is about to begin his ministry that we know that he is tempted and tested by Satan. And so, when we overlook the needs of others, we're not doing the Lord's work. We're doing Satan's work. And church family, we need to be reminded of that. We need to be aware of that. Now, the good news comes, though, in Ephesians chapter 2. Beginning with verse 1, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. That's a reference to Satan. And of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable riches of His grace expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, church, I read a story recently about a guy who was visiting a foreign country. It was an English-speaking country. It was South Africa. And he had an acquaintance there. His first time to visit the country. He was in Cape Town, a very large city. And so he phoned his friend and said, I'm now in town, as I told you I would be. Uh, when can we get together? And he said, well, rather than meeting somewhere, he said, my wife and I would just like to have you in our home. So she's going to prepare a meal. So they made arrangements. So the next night uh, he was going to take his rental car and was going to drive to their home in that part of the city. And the problem, he said, was is that by the time I left where I was staying, he said it was night. And furthermore, it was raining. Anyone who's ever driven a car at night in the rain knows how hard it can be to see, how much the rain diminishes your vision at night. And he says he got on the right highway. He uses the term expressway. Gets on the right expressway, and his friend told him, now you're going to be on this, on this highway for 10 miles before you need to start looking for the, the exit. Uh, that will take you to, to, to my, my house. And so, so he's on the road with every bit of confidence that all is well. 
But then it's more than 10 miles, it's 12 miles, it's 13 miles, it's 15 miles. And now he's saying, okay, I've, I never did see that sign. I missed the exit. So he gets off, goes to a service station that still happens to be open at night and asks them. And boy, they have no idea where he's talking about. He's realized after he looks at a map, this is back in the days before GPS, right? Because if, if he had GPS, there'd be no story. Uh, and so it's, it's back in the days where he unfolds the, the Rand McNally map of, of Cape Town, South Africa, and then figures out that he got on the right highway, but he went in the complete opposite direction. And he said that all ended well. He made to their house and had a very late supper with his friend and his wife. But he uses that example to show how we, as children of God, we can be in sin for so long that we no longer think anything about it. We can be making choices and doing something that we should not be doing for so long that it gets comfortable. As comfortable as going 10 miles in the wrong direction. And what that sin is, well, it's, it's different for so many of us. But whether that sin is to lie... I don't know about you, I've known people that lied so much, you got to the point where you, you didn't think they ever knew what the truth was. For some, it's to gossip. They love to talk about other people. For some, it might be sexual immorality. For some, it might be dishonesty. They're going to get ahead at any cost. They will steal people blind even their own family. So whatever that sin might look like, church, we can be people who just get comfortable in sin. It might be simply overlooking the needs of the people like Lazarus in our own world. And so... What Paul tells us here in Ephesians 2 is, man, look at what we once were. We once were dead, but now we're alive. But it's absolutely nothing that we do. It is a grace that comes from God. It is His gift to us. If we only accept that grace, repent of our sins, and are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then we are made alive. In these weeks that lead up to Easter, it's important for us to know what the people of God are up against. But it's also important for us to remember the triumph that Jesus makes. There is no question that the devil, that old scratch, is God's enemy. That he is God's adversary. But let's not ever make the mistake of thinking he is God's equal. Because church family, that has never, is not, and will never be the case. That we serve a God who is alive. We have a Savior who conquered death. And church family, isn't that good news? And so, we need to be people, though, who live like people who are alive in Christ. Not people who live for ourselves. 
That was the problem with the rich man. That's the problem that Paul describes as he opens the second part, or the second chapter of Ephesians. As for you, you were, past tense, dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. When you followed the ways of the devil, maybe not even realizing it. But it's a truth, church, that if we're not doing the Lord's work, we're doing the devil's. And so we make conscious decisions every day to do the work of the Lord. We are living demonstrations of the grace of God. Wrote this down last night. Once hopelessly lost in our sinful cravings, now we are free to live the life for which we were called. Been doing a lot of work lately counseling people who are in addiction recovery. And for people, if you've ever known someone who was an alcoholic or an addict, that they feel trapped by their addiction. They can easily feel like a slave to what they are addicted to. And a gentleman that I'm working with right now, I'll meet with him at 9 o'clock in the morning. And this is a session that he has been dreading. Because it's the part in the program where he has to put in writing an inventory of his pain. An inventory of all that he's experienced. And that's something you learn about addicts. Is that they don't just wake up one day and say, hey, I'm going to be a drug addict. No, they try something once upon a time to mask some pain that they're dealing with. And so drugs or alcohol become an escape from something that they're running from. And so they get clean and they start in the program. And now he's at the point where he has to give a name to everything. Now, I'm not going to name his name. He's not from here anyway, but that doesn't matter. But I'd appreciate it if you all would pray for this guy. God knows who he is. Because I met with him Friday afternoon and we spent some time in prayer and he's dreading tomorrow morning. And I told him, you have already told me all this. He said, yeah, but now I've got to put it in writing. He said, that's going to be harder. But church, we are all bound by something. Even if we're not addicts or alcoholics, we are slaves to our sin until we are made alive in Christ. And church, let's not ever forget what Jesus did for us. That He took the chains off of us. That He set us free from the burden of that sin. And so as Paul writes here and uses all these words that say past tense, you were dead. But he says now you're alive. But church family, the way for us to be an extension of God's grace... The way for us to show the world that we are alive is that we have to care about other people. We have to be people who care about other people. Even people that are not like us. Even people that don't like us. Even people that's not easy for us to like. 
But God wants us to care about other people. And that, church family, is part of the good works that He planned in advance for us to do. Because what good is it for God just to have a bunch of children who are saved unless they are doing His work? So let's be people. It starts right now. Who make a concerted effort to be kind to others. To be loving. To be the kind of people that do things for others that have them puzzled. Have them wondering, why would they do that for me? And at some point, someone may even ask you, why would you do this for me? And that church family is a golden moment where you get to say, it's not me. It's Jesus Christ who lives in me. And in so doing, you have an opportunity to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're not with us, if you are with us this morning, if you're not with us this morning, well, we love you anyway. You can watch it later on YouTube. But if you are with us this morning and you have not yet made the decision to give your life to Christ, we offer an invitation to allow you to set that straight and change your life forever. If you are here this morning and you've got something in your life you've been dealing with, something that you would like a body of believers to be praying with you about, then the invitation is offered for that reason as well. Let's stand and sing.